sin has he quickened and made alive. And for that we give him praise today. I'm getting ready to move out of the way and I'll be back in a moment, but if I had Sister Marshall's voice, <laughs> amen, I would sing an old song that said, because he loved me so, he bled and died. Yeah, on Calvary. Because he loved me so. And that's why we're here this morning. We celebrate him. Amen. I know that as tradition is, we typically will do uh, the seven last words of Christ on Good Friday. And we were not able to come together and be here. Uh, but we have some preachers, some ministers in the house this morning that are going to come. And I'm on back clean up. Amen. Amen. I'm on back clean up. I've already instructed them that they have five minutes. Uh, amen. So they got to go on and get in where they fit in. Amen. amen. But I'm going to ask them to come in the order in which they were selected. Uh, the seven last words of Christ. And I'm going to ask if you would get with them and uh, encourage them. Amen. As they come to us from the word of the Lord. And again, at the last voice that you would hear, I will come back. Amen. And I will back clean up. Lord have his way. Amen. 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 Would you receive Brother Bobby, Minister Bobby Sandy, do the heart and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Bobby, man, you stay right there, Josh. I'm almost done. Amen. Praise the Lord. I've heard a pastor say once before, there's a freight train coming. This freight train is named Crenshaw. Come on now. Kids got to get off the track. But I just want to give God the honor on today. Give my pastor, Reginald Crenshaw, and First Lady their honor today, allowing us to come and give a little word. <clears throat> I'm going to get right to it because five minutes, I'm almost done. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, if I was a and I am a praying man. This was a prayer. So I believe he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now when Jesus started this prayer, when he asked for forgiveness, he was on the cross. He was elevated and upright. He was elevated and upright. He was high and lifted up. Sisters, you have to understand when you are elevated, that's when you go through the most stuff you go through. When you are elevated, that is the time when you are, have to ask forgiveness the most. When you are elevated or when you're in your elevation, that's when you have the most complication, the most concerns, the most inconvenience, the most anxiety, the most danger, the most disorder. Folks talking about you, folks being jealous, folks in your business lying on you. Headaches. People trying to slow you down from doing the work of the Lord. When you're high and lifted up. When you're elevated. When you're elevated. Lord knows people are trying to slow you down but they don't know what it took for you to get where you are. Or they don't know the hell that you had to go through to stay holy and be where you are in Christ. Lord forgive them because they know not what they do. They know not what they do, Lord. This was not an ordinary prayer or a conversation on the cross. In my research, most scholars would call this a necessary schizophrenia. Because Jesus was not talking to another being. Jesus was not talking to, he was not talking to someone that was right next to him. He was talking to the great I am. He was talking to the Alpha, the Omega, the one who created all and who is all. Jesus was talking to himself. Amen. Brothers and sisters, nobody but God could ask God for forgiveness for the world that he created but God. Amen. Jesus was talking to himself. There's a reason why Jesus said, Father, forgive them that they know not what they do. And he didn't say, Father, forgive us. Because he was without sin. Right. Jesus was without sin, so he didn't say, Father, forgive us. Jesus knew that he was sinless. Father, forgive 
them for they know not what they do. Jesus wasn't playing, praying in the flesh. Jesus wasn't praying from a man. Jesus was praying in the spirit, y'all. Yeah. He was playing in the spirit because if he was playing in the flesh, only the ones around him would have been forgiven. But Jesus was praying in the spirit. This was no ordinary prayer. Jesus had to reach into divinity to surpass the notion of time to completely cover the man of his sin. He had to step into the spirit realm to cover the actions of man. See, you didn't live in that moment in the flesh. So you resided in that moment in spirit. So he could cover you at that moment in spirit because he was speaking in the spirit trying to cover what was to come, what was here, and what was to come. Do you hear what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? He had to step back in time so he could cover Cain and Abel. So he could cover David and Bathsheba. He could cover Samson and Delilah. Because he was praying in the spirit, he could cover you last night. He could cover you an hour ago. He could cover you five minutes ago. He could cover me when I was late for prayer meeting this morning. Thank you, Lord. He could cover us. But because he was in the spirit, trying to make it personal, he forgave us in the spirit. Now Jesus was forgiving us for our sins. He had to die on the cross. He had to die on the cross. Are you hearing me today? Because he had to cover us even before we was a thought in our mother's mind. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to pose this question and then I'm going to get out of the way. Did Jesus, or why didn't Jesus ask for forgiveness before he got on the cross? He didn't ask for forgiveness because he had to wait to that moment. He was predestined to be there. And the reason why he had to ask for forgiveness is because the first man didn't. He had to ask for forgiveness because the first man didn't. Even though he knew well, he should have known because he ate from the tree of, of knowledge in life and death, of evil and good. So he should have known to ask for forgiveness. But Jesus had to come and clean it up. Jesus had to come and make it right for man. Jesus had to come. Jesus had to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. God, I can't God the Praise the Lord, everyone. They gave me this awesome task. Number two, uh, the scripture would be Luke 23:43. Luke 23:43. Giving honor to God and past the first lady and all the saints. This is an awesome passage that I'm not big enough to do, but I will take the five minutes. And one is already gone. The introduction is an opening of scripture. Let me read. I want to start before I get to verse 43 is the focus verse, but I want to start at verse 39. Verse 39 says, And one of the male factors which were hanged real on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Thus not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And what I want to say in quickly is, I want to name it the conversation. This was a conversation that the people on the ground didn't hear. This is a conversation that was going on between those that were up on the cross. Jesus was hanging between two male factors. 
male factors are people that are felons, guilty of crimes, do all kinds of stuff. I was one of those people. I don't know about you, I was one of those people. He saved me. I was hanging in sin, and everybody in here should be up under that, was hanging in sin. But Jesus, I looked at it in a different view. Most people focus on the word paradise, and people had questions over years how it was preached and taught. What did they say? What did you say? What did they No, if you read it, one only responded the proper way to Christ. And what he received, as far as paradise is concerned, he received the interest to the kingdom of God. That's what he received at that point. Because he repented, he was humble, and he showed faith and acknowledging who Jesus was at that moment. That's all that could be offered to him before the crucifixion. If we read and study the word, that's all we had before the New Testament church came. The message of John was what? Repentance. That's all we can get up to that point. So until Jesus died and was crucified, he couldn't go back and get those that didn't get what we have, which is the Holy Ghost, the outpouring of his spirit and being baptized in his name. But this other male factor that humbled himself received that permission as far as the kingdom of God is concerned. I know people will say salvation. No, we can't deal with salvation because it wasn't presented at that time. But he was spared and placed in a place where Jesus put him until everything was taken care of. If we take time to read the scripture. That's not me. That's revelation. So y'all deal with that from there. But I want to deal with the other male factor, which was the one that doubted. He doubted. He was demanding. And he was not humble in his sin. He was telling Christ what to do. And if he be this, do this, do that, do this, do that. And we can't do that in prayer. And what we do concerning God, you don't demand nothing from God. You can't doubt and come to God. He that come to God is what? First believe that what? He is. And that he is a reward of them that. It's a consistent thing. It ain't one and done with God. And this was no bedside man of prayer with the male factor that repented. That was no bedside salvation prayer. He put the other male factor in check and told him he don't need to be doing what he was doing. We're all guilty of what we're guilty of. That's why we're up here hanging. So when we look and see somebody that's not saved as we know to be saved, we need to realize we were in that same position. Jesus became the perfect witness unto death and until death because the end of his life he was still witnessing laying between two people that wasn't saved. We need to find ourselves between people that are not saved. We can't save each other laying among ourselves or being sitting between ourselves. Jesus was the ultimate witness. Who did Jesus hang with? Publicans and what? Who did Jesus die with? Okay, thank you. So we can't be caught up in the four walls of the building worrying about who we're, who you're with or whatever like that. The saints are going to be here. But our responsibility is to be lying and being found with those that need him. If you got him, we're supposed to be that Jesus that's hanging between the two male factors. How do they know what to do? Who do they know who to look to? If you don't have Jesus with you, you are the light of what? Okay, let's be the light. So let's turn the light on. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Give it out to God who's ahead of my life, to my pastor, first lady, and everybody in their respective places. Praise the Lord. Um, I woke up this morning and what was in my spirit was an old song that says, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Singing and praying in my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I thank the Lord for this task. And um, technology. <laughs> uh, my other word is a third word, and it was woman, behold thy son, behold thy mother. It's from John 19, 26 and 27. And it reads, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. Now out of the four gospel writers, John is the only one who records Mary's presence at the cross. Jesus addresses his mother as a mother 
does not address his mother as a mother, but as woman. Now we may think this is disrespectful to address our mother as woman in our culture, but back in Jesus' culture, that was a respectful thing to do. For a man to address a woman that, that and it would be strange for a, mother, a man to address a mother, uh, his mother as son. As Mary's firstborn, Jesus is legally responsible for her welfare to ensure that she has a place to live and food to eat, since she is a widow. Jesus charges John the disciple with the responsibility of taking care of his mother in his absence, and John takes this commission seriously, as it states in the B clause of the 27th verse. From that time on this, the disciple took her into his home. Now, why did Jesus entrust Mary the Apostle John instead of his brother. Well, first of all, only the Gospel of John mentions that the disciple whom Jesus loved was John. Even though Mary had other sons, Jesus chose John to provide care for Mary because Jesus' brothers did not become believers until after his resurrection. Also, Jesus' brothers were not present at his crucifixion. What was the relationship between his mother and John? His mother was John's aunt. That means John and his brother James were not only Jesus' disciples, but also Jesus' half-cousins. So when Jesus told John to behold your mother, he was telling John to take care of his aunt like he was his own mother. What are we to learn from this third word? First of all, love our family. First, we must love our parents no matter what. Second of all, the responsibility of our family. We are responsible for family obligations. Jesus was clear that his disciples must put commitment to him above family relationships. Our obedience to Christ must become primary and obedience to parents must be secondary. Jesus, because we are Christians, or just because we are Christians, doesn't mean that we are not responsible for family obligations. The Apostle Paul states in 1 Timothy 5 and 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Number three, Jesus' will, Jesus's willingness to care for you. If Jesus was so eager to care for his mother in her hour of need, how much more is he eager to care for his disciples who hear the word of God today and do it? In one sense, it is very risky to hear and do the word of God, for the word of God is calling us to sacrificial acts of love. But in another sense, it is safer and more rewarding than to hear and do the word of God, because Jesus said, those who hear and do the word of God are my mother and my brothers. Loving obedience to the word of God puts us in a relationship to Jesus, which is more intimate and more certain to be heard and helped than the nearest family member. If Jesus could provide for the needs of his own in a moment of his deepest weakness and humiliation, how much more can he provide for the need of his present power and exaltation? Not only are you as an obedient disciple in a better position than Jesus' own mother to receive blessings at the hand of the Lord, but he is now in a better position to give it to you than he was to her. According to Ephesians 1 and 19, the greatness of God's power, which is working on behalf of us who believe, accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which God generated by raising Jesus from the dead, and giving him incom incomparable glory and power and wealth of all things. So when he contemplates, when we contemplate, we are reminded in Philippians 4 and 19, that the Apostle Paul says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Our risen Christ is so full of glorious and riches that he need not turn anyone away. As Paul says in Romans 10 and 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches to all who call upon him. Now the church, the last thing is the church as a new spiritual family is what we learned from this third word. Whatever the reason for not putting Mary in the care of her other sons, the new relationship between Mary and John illustrates for us the provision made in the body of Christ. When Jesus says to Mary, look on John as your son and not to John or Mary as your mother, he is showing how he needs to be, how our needs are to be met when we have left everything to follow him. Paul says in Acts 20 and 28 that Christ purchased the church of God with his own blood. Yeah. Therefore, one of
one of the gifts Jesus gave to us from the cross was the church. So let us all take courage in the care and power and provision of our Lord. He, If he was eager to take care of his mother, how much more eager would he be today to care for those who hear and do the word of God? If Jesus could provide for the needs more than he provides for the need in the present, wealth and power and exaltation. And if Jesus purchased the church with his own blood and ordained that in the grieving mother find sons and sons, find mothers, then no one should be without a caring family today in the body of Christ. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.